Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Join our community to claim your podcast listener discount on my Valuation Masterclass Bootcamp, where students learn how to value companies like a pro and advance their career. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com to join the community for free. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Fred Diamond. Fred, are you ready to rock? I am thrilled. So excited to be here. So so excited to be here. I'm so happy to, and, uh, to have you here, and it's been really good to get to know you and follow you on LinkedIn and see all the contributions that you make to this world. I want to introduce you to the audience. Fred Diamond is the co-founder of the Institute for Excellence in Sales, a member organization for sales leaders and their teams. Members include Amazon, Salesforce, Red Hat Software, and Intel. He is also the host and producer of the award-winning Sales Game Changers podcast and webcast. Fred is based in Washington, D.C., and I have to say, we are both Tom Petty fans. <laughs> Fred, take a minute and fill in for their tidbits about your life. No, nah, it's great to be here. I'm in Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC. I'm from Philadelphia originally. I'm a big Philadelphia fan. So uh, if we have any listeners out there in uh, Philly, it's good to hear from you. Good to see you. And uh, I love what you're doing. I, I listen to your podcast. They're very, very compelling and interesting stories. I like the angle. It's unique. And uh, we'll talk about something a little bit different today, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I wonder if you can tell us just a little bit about, let's say, for the listeners out there, let's say, you know, my listeners all across the world, tell us a little bit about some tidbits about like your expertise and what you bring to the world of sales, what you bring through either your podcast and your other contributions. And, you know, I know um, you write a lot on LinkedIn. So for the listeners out there, just go to Fred Diamond and look for him on LinkedIn. I also have the links in the show notes. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about your secret sauce of what it is about you. Sure. So I run what's called the Institute for Excellence in Sales. And uh, Andrew, most of my early career was in corporate marketing. I worked for Apple Computer for a long time, Compaq Computer, a large software company called CompuWare. But I always knew that uh, sales was the most critical function in a company. So 2002, I went to work for myself as an outsource chief marketing officer. And then most of my clients that were hiring me were sales VPs who were struggling because marketing wasn't really going well. So we created the Institute for Excellence in Sales in 2012. We've been fortunate to have some great member companies like what you talked about. And we run programs for their sales organizations. We have a amazing program that I'm very proud about called the Women in Sales Program. It's called the Women in Sales Leadership Forum. We have women in sales from all over the world. And we talk about things like presence, decision-making, um, presentation, networking. The commonality is they're all women in sales, but you know, leadership skills, if you will. And our mission is to help sales leaders acquire, retain, motivate, and elevate top tier sales talent. So everybody who's involved with the IES, they know that they're in sales. Uh, our good friend, Lisa Earl McLeod wrote a book called sales is a noble profession. Selling is a noble profession. We believe in that. You know, we don't have too many people who are like, ooh, I'm afraid of sales. We embrace the profession. We uh, do four webcasts a week. We do one for women in sales, one where I interview sales VPs. And every Thursday we do a show just on mindset. We talk about the mindset side of sales. I have some leadership coaches. I have had famous athletes. I've had entertainers talking about the mind side, you know, of selling, which is so critical. And then every Friday we do a show called creativity in sales, where we talk about sales process tactics, things like prospecting, social selling. So we're all about helping the sales professional take his or her career to the next level. Exciting. Well, I'm going to have all of your links in the show notes. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to learn more, just go there and click on them. I know from my perspective, sales as a finance guy, I people look and they say finance is hard. I always say, no, 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 no. Sales is hard. <laughs> finance yeah. is actually just a lot of formulas. Okay, we got to make up some assumptions and 
be a be good bullshitters, but you know, with sales, you got to get out there on the front lines. As I said in the when I was head of research, uh, running re teams of sales, I said that you know, the salespeople who are calling the fund managers and the, the clients around the world, uh, and they're using our research to talk to them. I always say that you know the salespeople are on the front line with their rifles, and research is the bullet. And if we do not provide the bullets to the salespeople, how would you feel being on the front line and being fired at by your competitors and you don't have anything to fire back? And that was kind of my best way of describing in a research operation for you know research related to investing in the stock market. Um, but I, I really learned, and I didn't understand it when I was younger, but now I know the value of sales is massive. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, if, if nothing gets sold, then there's no reason for accounting. You know, you talked about finance. There's no reason for a finance department, no reason for product. Things have to be sold. You know, you're asking what are some of the little tidbits. Uh, you know, we talk about things like empathy. We talk about things like accountability. We talk about prospecting, obviously. We talk about research, preparation. But the key word, Andrew, that comes through time and time again, courage. You know, to be successful in sales, you need to have courage. You need to get past blocks. You need to think about what's stopping you, you know, either internally or at your company or in the customer site. I mean, yeah, the last 18 months, right? You know, having to sell through the pandemic at home you know, without your team around you. And it's uh, the sales professionals who have made it through, their companies are making it through because of the sales organization. So we, uh, we, we appreciate the role of the sales professional and we celebrate it. And uh, we're very, very proud to be able to do that. That's beautiful. Well, <laughs> um, I love it. And I know for the listeners out there, a lot of people, you know, as, as my uh, business partner saw, says, he has two sayings. We have a coffee factory and we sell a lot of coffee oh. here in Thailand. And as he says, coffee solves everything and sales solves everything. So there's so many problems that, uh, you know, you can just get out of if you can sell. So I'm glad to have you on the show. And I think, you know, uh, for the listeners out there, follow Fred on LinkedIn, learn more. We'll have links in the show notes. All right. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be. Tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to it and then tell us your story. Well, this is going to be a little bit of a different twist than a lot of your guests. So, uh, you know, even though I have an MBA, it was in marketing. So you're a finance guy. I think I got a D in finance when I got my MBA and I, <laughs> um, that's not true. I probably got a B. probably got to be in a, in a in managerial accounting as well. But uh, so I'm going to tell a little bit of a different story and it's more of a career story. Uh, I have, uh, so I worked for Apple, like I mentioned, and I worked in the beginning of my career it was my second job. I worked for McGraw-Hill in the first job. And one thing I began to notice, the McGraw-Hill company I worked for reviewed tech companies. So I got to review Apple and I got to see Apple at its, you know, at its finest in the early days, the Steve Jobs, the Wozniak days. So I said, I want to go work for one of those types of companies, you know, a company that's going to have like a lot of the Silicon Valley excitement, big stock payoff, the IPO you know, of course, the Netscape and, and all those kinds of things. And that's what my career was really focused on. So I uh, started my career in Philadelphia, where I'm from. I went to college in Atlanta, Georgia, Emory University. Then I moved back to Philly. I had a fraternity brother, uh, and I'll mention his name. His name is Mark Byron. And he's an absolutely fantastic guy. He was a year younger than me. And he was a absolutely brilliant guy. I'll give you a clue. I was a year older than him. When I went back to Emory, the year after I graduated, I went back as a, you know, the next year we had a fraternity formal and a lot of guys came back. I stayed in Mark's apartment. 1985, he had a K pro PC, right? So here I am at this company that's evaluating all the PC companies when the PC, IBM PC compatibles became big. He had a K pro computer in his dining room. And I walk in and I'm like, how did you get a K-Pro? And he was stunned that I knew about K-Pro. I said, buddy, I said, you're going to go far. Long story short, he went so far, he created three companies that he sold for $5 billion. I'm kind of giving away the punchline. But here's, here's the story. Two years after I graduated, I was two years out of college. I get a call from him. He goes, hey, Freddie, he goes, I'm starting a company. I'm inviting people to come up to New York. We're going to talk about what kind of company we want to start. 
And I'm like, yeah, okay. All right. You know, even though I was impressed with him in college, I also remembered him wearing nothing but sweats and a t-shirt. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to put my chips into this guy's basket, if you will. So I didn't go to the meeting and I called him a year later. I said, Hey, whatever happened? He said, ah, he goes, nobody showed up. So I created the company anyway, and we're off and running. And I'm like, that's great. Now, Andrew, I thought that my process was going to be work for a great company, work for another great company, go to a startup that's going, get a bunch of shares, hit a million dollar, you know, stock IPO type of a thing. And I knew what my path looked like yet. Here was my ticket right here. About seven years later, he calls me, uh, I was working a compact computer and uh, he sold basically direct marketing services. And the way I tell the story is every time someone buys a cruise, he gets three bucks you know, through flyers and coupons and all those things. It might be oversimplifying it. So uh, he asked me if he could get a meeting at Compaq and he would like to pitch their services. So I was in marketing. So I got a meeting with him and the guy who was in charge of direct marketing. Mark and his partner came down. They did a great presentation. Afterwards, he said, hey, he goes, yeah, I'm sure you like it here, but you know, why don't you come work for me? He says, you know, he goes, I think we'll have some fun. We're, we're ready to take it to the next level you know, why don't you come up to New York or Jersey, you know, and I'm like, eh, you know, I still didn't quite see it. He didn't picture, I didn't, he didn't look like the pre IPO startup thing that was going to happen there. And uh, I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stay here at Compaq, you know, a company that was kind of past its prime. Even then this was the mid nineties. Uh, anyway, fast forward. Uh, I had a wife who wanted to move back to Detroit. You're from Cleveland. So we moved to Detroit in the late nineties and I went to work for a company that did mainframe software. And, uh, I had to move to Detroit. My first wife wanted to move back home. Her mother was getting ill. So we moved to Detroit. I hated working for this company. I got to travel all over the world. I didn't make it to Thailand, but I did make it to Singapore, Australia, Bali, Indonesia, all over the United States, all over Europe. But the stocks had already happened. There was no way I was going to make a lot of money. I was you know, making a decent salary as a marketing director, but I wasn't going to make big money. So I told my then wife, I said, I can't stay here. I said, the window's closing on these pre-IPO type things. We got to figure it out real quick and it's not going to happen in Detroit. And she said, okay, if you find something, I'll consider moving. So I went to New Jersey to see my friend. Um, and the reason I went to Jersey was because I was going to fly to, uh, to Germany for some customer meetings. So I stopped over to have lunch with him. And I told him what I'm looking to do. I said, I'm looking for a new thing, pre-IPO, when I hit the stock home run. And uh, he said, Freddie, he goes, he called me Freddie. Uh, he said, you know, why don't you come work for me? He goes, I'll put you in the DC. I'm trying to get into DC. You know, you come work for me in DC. I'll pay you $150,000 a year. I'll give you 10,000 shares and I'll, I'll move you from, from Detroit. And I remember my response, Andrew, it was like this, like, ah, no, nah, that's okay. You know, you don't look like, you know, these big pre IPO things, you know, that are hitting. And I was like, ah, nah, nah, that's okay, Mark. And I eventually wound up getting a job in, in Washington, DC with a pre IPO company in 2000, that was in and out in one year, you know, classic thing, raise $80 million in expensive money. And then uh, eventually it just spent it all and just closed the Friday before the Friday before Thanksgiving, you know, told people to leave, it was a horrible, horrible thing. Right. I then went to another company that was a pre-IPO that burned out after a year as a data storage company. And then I went to work for myself in 2002. Uh, I started the Institute for Excellence in Sales in 2011, and I started running it full-time in 2015. So I'm happy. You know, the Institute for Excellence in Sales, we're having a great time. We provide great service. You know, it's, it's a living. You know, I'm earning a decent living. I can't complain. But I met my friend... Uh, about four years ago, uh, he would call me every year on my birthday. And uh, he was, that's why he became so successful. And uh, four years ago, he said, Freddie, he goes, I, I got some news for you. I'm like, what's the news? He says, I have this disease. It's called, um, it's called Mars. And he says, don't look it up because you're not going to find anything. He said, but you know, I have about four years left. He said, it's basically going to take over my body like ALS or Lou Gehrig's. And uh, I want you to know. So I'm like, oh, well, I want to come see you. And he goes, all right, well, I'm going for some treatment, but we'll definitely make it allow you to come up here. So 2017, I went up there to New Jersey to meet him and he was in a wheelchair. He was, you could see he was losing some of his, his stuff. 
and his daughter was there. He wanted me to tell his daughter all these stories about him. And I'm sitting there and he's sitting there. And then he said, Freddie, he goes, you were such an important person in my career. I really wished you had come work for me, but I understand. He said, I want to let you know, I want to help you because I've created a company that we sold three times for $5 billion. And he said, he said, I've kept a billion of dollars, billion of that for myself. And I've made all these people. And there's another guy in our fraternity who went to work for him. I remember thinking like, oh, boy, I guess I missed an opportunity. Yeah. But I also, but I also said, you know what? I missed an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, kind of a little twist on your, your podcast here. You know, the worst investment was, was not going to work for Mark. Now, I don't know if I would have, you know, made a hundred billion dollars with him. It might not have worked out. It might not have been, I might not have enjoyed myself. Who knows? But three times, you know, three times, Andrew, he came to me and said, he came to me and said, I want you to come work for me. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, for the listeners out there, the lessons, it didn't look like what I thought it was supposed to look like. You know, there's all these IPOs happening at the end of the 1990s. And I thought it looked like a certain thing. Company has an A round, a B round, a C round. You get your 10, 15,000 shares. You know, you get them, uh, you know, priced at a certain point, valued at a certain point. Company IPOs, you're worth something on paper. A year goes by, you can start cashing them in, right? Mm. You know, I thought that's what it looked like. Startup, Silicon Valley startup type of a thing. In retrospect, I had no idea. You know, none of the none of the pre-IPOs I was with did anything. Most of them fail, you know, as you know. Had I, the one company I went to, had it IPO'd, we would have all been underwater because the market crashed in 2000. But, you know, I tell young people who ask me for advice, I say, if you ever think you're going to go work for yourself one day, make a list of the 10 people that you really respect in college that you can see yourself working for and keep that list in your desk somewhere. When you're ready, go research those 10 people if you're not in touch and think about working with them because uh, that's where you meet the people that you know you can trust. You know, you have those great moments, those crazy moments, the why'd she leave me moments, you know, the tearful moments, the beer, the tequila, whatever. And uh, Byron would have been on that list. Um, of blessed memory, he actually passed away during COVID of the disease, but he lived a full life and he made a lot of people wealthy. And he also gave a lot of money to uh, charity and things like that. So mm. that, that's my story. <clears throat> well, let me, uh, let me uh, summarize what I took away from it. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that we have to realize, of course, with this show is that hindsight is twenty twenty. We have hindsight bias when we're looking back. And so when we're in the situation, we see things differently than when we see them coming out. Uh, and that, that's an important lesson right there. I mean, don't expect, you know, every now and then things are going to just seem blaringly, glaringly obvious. But most of our life, it's not going to be that clear and obvious right but i think also you've told the story of this is what i thought it should look like yes and right. it didn't fit that and therefore i'm not gonna look at it and i think my takeaway from that is that our goal you know to 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 to, to take the opportunities that come in front of us we've got to be open to those opportunities and yeah. And the other thing, yeah, I mean, that's a great ahead. point. You know, it's, it's interesting too, because, you know, he, he said to me many times over the years, and we've kept in, in close contact. And he said, Freddie, he said, I want to let you know, you were one of the first people uh, to really see something in me. And he said, you know, I wanted to kind of give you something back on that. And, uh, and we talked about when I seen him, I actually saw him one, uh, two more times after that, and he lost his ability to speak and communicate. But that one time that I saw him in 2017, he did say to me, I, I want to help you. And we, we, I felt kind of bad because his health was going down and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could have used an investment, but I really didn't want to ask him at that point. And, you know, it just, the time had passed, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't want to be, you know, one of these people as this, as this guy is dying, but, but uh, the other message too, there is, you know, if you think about this and in, in your world line of work as well, you know, who do you trust? You know, one thing we talk a lot about at the Institute for Excellence in Sales is being trusted, you know, being the concept of a trusted advisor, right? You know, do you trust a thousand people? Do you trust a hundred? You know, at the end of the day, when you really get down to it, there's a small group of people, you know, Jim Rohn talks about the five people, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, you want to have closest to you. You know, maybe you have four, maybe you have a dozen, whatever it might be, but there really is a limited amount of people that you could truly, truly 
trust. And I'll be honest with you, some of the people you meet in college now, Byron didn't look like in 2016, like he did in 1985. You know, I remember him, you know, he, he didn't have a nickel to his name. You know, he, uh, I remember we were playing poker once and he kept borrowing money from me. And, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, maybe uh, kind of clouded, you know, my mm. thinking of, mm. but this, and then people grow, people change, people learn things, uh, you know, find more. If you're listening to the show, you know, ask some of those questions, you know, learn about your people who seem to be successful. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, some that you know, at the age of 17 is different than someone, you know, at 27, someone different than, you know, at 50. Mm. And uh, you got to be open to understanding what that looked like. And I, I really wasn't. I, I, res- I always told him, I said, I respect how well you've done. I'm proud of you, but I never really appreciated it till, you know, the opportunity had passed. There's three things that I uh, want to mention about now that you're talking about it. The first thing is about trust. So let's talk about that. I, I teach an ethics class in CFA for chartered financial analysts. And I always ask the audience, you know, think about it for a moment and try to answer this question. How many people do you truly trust if you had a secret that you wanted to tell, but you didn't want the world to know? You know, you know, there's, you know the people not to talk to because they'll go out and tell the world. But how many people would you really trust? And the answer to that is between zero and five. And I always say, you know, if you think it's five, you probably haven't tested them well enough. So first thing that I try to teach them is that from that, we've already produced some kind of empirical evidence that trust is rare. So then I challenge them, like, what kind of person are you? If I ask the people around you, are you the one that they say uh, is trustworthy? And the second thing, I want to talk about the story of the drowning man. I have to tell this story, uh, and I know some people will have heard it, but I'll, I'll just tell it really quickly, and that is, a fellow was stuck on his rooftop in a flood. He was praying to God for help. Soon a man in a rowboat came by and the fellow shouted to the man on the roof, jump in, I can save you. The stranded fellow shouted back, no, it's okay, I'm praying to God and he is going to save me. So the rowboat went on. Then a motorboat came by. The fellow in the motorboat shouted, jump in, I can save you to this stranded man. And he said, no thanks, I'm praying to God, he's going to save me, I have faith. So the motorboat went on. Then the helicopter came by and the pilot shouted, grab this rope and I will lift you to safety. And to this, the stranded man replied, no thanks, I'm praying to God. He's going to save me. I have faith. So the helicopter reluctantly flew away. Soon the water rose above the rooftop and the man drowned. He went to heaven. He finally got his chance to discuss the whole situation with God, at which point he exclaimed, I had faith in you, but you didn't save me. You let me down. I don't understand why. To this, God replied, I sent you a rowboat a motorboat and a helicopter. What more do you expect? Yeah, that's a great, I, I love that story. I have a similar one. If you don't mind my telling you real quick, yeah. uh, man goes into a, uh, uh, Abe, Abe goes into a, uh, a synagogue and uh, he says, God, you need to help me. I need to win the lottery. Please help me. And then he goes back in. You probably even know the punchline already. He goes in on Wednesday, says, God, it's Abe. You got to help me, please. I need to win the lottery. Goes in Thursday, goes back in Friday. And he says, God, it's Abe. I really need to win the lottery. I have so many debts. Goes in on Saturday on the Jewish Sabbath. And he says, God, it's Abe. Please help me out. I need to win the lottery. All of a sudden, he hears this booming voice, Abe, buy a ticket. So, you know, similar type of a thing. It's like, you know, you got to, first of all, you got to see what the opportunities might be. And secondly, you got to, you got to step in, right? You know, you got to lean into those and, you know, you can't be afraid. I, I don't spend a whole lot of time wondering if I had gone to work for, for Mark. I mean, at the same time, again, uh, I really haven't spent that much time with it, but you know, if I had sector, what, you know, my life definitely would have changed. And uh, you know, the other thing too is back to the concept of trust. Uh, you know, there's very few people that you genuinely like, mm. you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. if you think about it, how many friends do you really have? I heard an interview with, I think like Daryl Hall or something, some rock star who said he has like three friends. I'm like, yeah, what do we mean? Like three friends. I mean, you know, so if you think about that, it's like, you know, how many, yeah. I mean, Howard Stern talks about that all the time. It's like, yeah, I have no friends. I'm like, no friends. I mean, so uh, Howard Stern being a big DJ and serious, but the same thing, it's like, you know, the ability, if you're out there listening to work with people that you like, you know, that you've, you've gone through, it doesn't mean it's always going to be fun because, yep. you know, when you're, when you create a company that's it's worth tough. five bill, you still got to work pretty hard, man. And yeah. there's pros and cons and ups and downs and bankruptcies along the way. And 
people get sick and someone dies and all that stuff. Well, um, <clears throat> one last thing. I said there was three things. The third thing is mm -hmm. there's a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. And it's a, obviously a very big bestseller. And I always tell people this is a terrible book. Mm -hmm. Terrible advice. And people say, well, why do you say that? I mean, this is a number one bestseller. I said, because the rich dad was an entrepreneur. The poor dad was a salary man. Right? Mm -hmm. So now let's just take the statistic of what percent of people in this world are entrepreneurs. Mm. We're yeah, talking really about 0. 0.00 whatever that number is. So here's a book that's advising everybody, everybody to be an entrepreneur. What awful advice to give to people. If everybody followed that book, millions of people would crash and lose everything because they're just mm. not made out to be an entrepreneur. So when I, <clears throat> at the end of this podcast, I say to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth, I'd like to tell people that you want to separate the idea of creating wealth from growing wealth. We grow wealth mm -hmm. by investing carefully in the stock market and, you know, investing in business and letting that grow. And I tell people, don't go into the stock market to, to create your wealth. <clears throat> you create that wealth either through business or the poor dad. My father was a salesman all of his life. He had a great salary, you know, nothing, nothing fancy, but he was able to build. If you can keep your costs below your monthly income, you are creating wealth every single month. So that's a second way you start a business. A second way is that you get a salary job and you keep your costs low. Now you've created wealth every single month. And the third way I always tell people, if you are not an entrepreneur, find one and help him be successful. And those are the three ways that I see to build wealth or create wealth uh, in our lives. So, you know, those are threat. Those are great. I love the way you said it. The other thing I tell people too is, um, uh, you know, the guy who makes 200,000, but spends 200,001 is worse off than the guy who makes 30 and only spends 29. So I, I've seen so many people who are unhappy. One of my big beliefs, Andrew, is that the cause of a lot of unhappiness is spending above your means. And, uh, <clears throat> So that's a whole separate topic. I'm yep. sure you've talked about many times, but, uh, yep. you know, if you, if you spend less than what you make, um, you have potential to, to, uh, to have a happy life. Fantastic. All right. Based <laughs> upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Well, you know, it's a great question. Uh, the other, the other little twist to it is that it took me until 2002 to work for myself. So, you know, I graduated from college in 1984. And then, you know, I always knew when I was at Apple, I was like, wow, everybody here, this was one of my misconceptions. I was like, everybody here wants to create the next Apple. And I was wrong with that. What I realized was most of the people at Apple, because it was the best company in the world at the time, wanted to work for a great company. You know, I liked what you said before about 0.00%. Mm -hmm. And I thought everybody here wants to start the next Apple. Well, the reality is very, very few people wanted to start the next Apple, but they wanted to work for a great company. Uh, it took me until 2002 to finally work for myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I, you know, I like to tell people I worked at Apple, then Compaq, then a large software company, then two startups that just kind of blew up. And finally, I was given this opportunity in 2002. I was like, all right, let's figure this out. Let's go create something. Um, yeah, I tell people too, if you want to work for yourself, start it sooner. You know, the old expression, best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So, you know, it was kind of like, finally, I got the opportunity to, to work for myself, which I always wanted to do. You know, uh, I don't know if I really had the mindset to start it earlier, but, you know, sometimes I say to myself, yeah, I don't have to go to Compaq or the company in Detroit. You know, I could have started to work for myself right after Apple. You know, mm. so if that's if that's something you really want to do out there as well, you know, a lot of times people say, make sure you have this big base and you have a job and work at night. I tell people, you know what, if you're a committed man, cut the bait, meet some smart people, be smart, hire someone, you know, like uh, Andrew and figure out, you know, where's the cash? Where's it going to come from? Get the support of a spouse. If you don't have a spouse that's willing to support you, get the hell out of there. But get another uh, spouse, yeah, <laughs> no, you know, I tell people the number one secret to success is a uh, supportive spouse. Yeah. And uh, last question, what is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Well, I have three, uh, but the number one goal is to grow the Institute for Excellence in Sales. So we have a, a great opportunity to, uh, because of the pandemic, we've been exposed outside of the DC area. Prior to the pandemic, we were very focused on DC, which is a very good market. It's the, 
fifth largest metropolitan statistical area in the United States or in North America for that matter. So there's a lot of business for us, a lot of B2B, a lot of companies. But because of the pandemic, we've met people all over the world, uh, not just people like you who that we're networking with, but sales VPs and, and customers all around the world. So we're looking to triple the size of the business in the next 12 months. And I think we can do it. Exciting. And we'll have the links to all that in the show notes, ladies and gentlemen. So you may be a part of that. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of law to keep you winning. My number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you, my listener, reduce risk and increase return in your life. To achieve this, I've created our community at myworstinvestmentever.com. And when you join, you also get that special discount on my Valuation Masterclass Boot Camp. As we conclude, Fred, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment do you have any parting words for the audience? I am honored to have that. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell people out there, if I sounds trite, but, you know, if you have a dream, go follow it. Start today. No better time than today. Even uh, as we're kind of hopefully winding down this pandemic, get out there and make something happen. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.